Well, I am Pastor Brandon. Uh, welcome to Cincy Reformed, and I'm joined with a special guest today, uh, Bill Bokenstein. And um, he is on because he is going to kind of give us a sneak preview into uh, a few of the talks that he's going to be given at a conference that Westside Reformed Church in Cincinnati, Ohio, is going to, to hold on August 27th. Uh, Friday evening, August 27, we're going to hold a nurture conference. And the theme of this conference is God-centered schooling or God-centered education. And this conference is not geared toward any one method of education. So it's not advocating homeschooling over all the other kinds of schooling or Christian private schooling over other kinds. It's, it's more general, um, uh, God-centered education. So um, if you're homeschooling, if you're in public school or private school, you can benefit from this conference. And um, we've asked uh, Bill to give a couple um, talks um, to us um, in this uh, conference that we're going to have. Uh, but before we get a sneak preview into what Bill is going to be um, speaking on, I thought maybe you could open us up and maybe tell us a bit about yourself, about your family, uh, about your church, where you serve right now. Yeah, well, it's so good to talk with you, Brandon. I uh, love what's going on in Cincinnati at, at Westside Reform. So thankful for the work there. And i am uh, had the privilege to speak a few times over the last several years. So excited to come back again. Um, yeah, so my wife and I, my wife Amy and I have four children. We uh, live in Kalamazoo, Michigan. I have been serving the church here, Manual Fellowship, for uh, about six years. I had served a small reform church in Northeast Pennsylvania for seven years prior to that, ordaining the ministry in 2008. So it's been, uh, it's been a blessing to me not only to be, uh, you know, a minister in terms of uh, pastoring the flock and uh, leading worship services, preaching God's word to, to God's people, but also to uh, to be able to write a bit over the last uh, decade and a half of ministry. So, so thankful for that. Um, and some of what uh, I've been able to work on in writing, I think, is is tied into what this conference is all about. So I had the privilege of writing uh, some children's stories that walk kids through the background of the three forms of unity, the Heidelberg Catechism, the Belgic Confession, the Canons of Dort, uh, to provide a, con a context and to provide um, yeah, just kind of a window into, uh, you know, what at first seems like just, just a sort of doctrinal formulations, but they also have a context and a history, and they, that can be encouraging to know what's going on. So, um, wrote a couple biographies on Ulrich Zwingli, which uh, was, um, yeah, encouraging to me and hopefully to others as well. One for young adults and one for for uh, adult readers as well. So, so thankful that some of the, the things that the Lord's been leading me to do over the last several years, uh, hopefully dovetails well with what you're trying to do in Cincinnati. Looking forward to be part of that. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Um, and, and that's, you know, part of the reason that we uh, were excited to have you on, you know, given the things that you have um, uh, written about, you've um, been thinking about this for a while. And so, you know, I think that we can uh, definitely glean a lot of insight into the things that you've been working on over the past um, few years. So I thought maybe, could you give us a sneak peek into uh, the first talk that you're going to be giving? Because you're going to give two two talks. And so maybe could you tell us uh, the title of your first talk and maybe give us just a, a few nuggets about maybe what we're going to experience at this conference. Yeah. So still, still kind of work on the title, but the first talk is on Christian biography, just the importance of reading uh, Christian biography for young people, uh, for all of us really, but want to encourage young folks to start reading Christian biography. Um, and, you know, I, I don't know if you, you probably noticed this too, Brandon, when you see kids reading books, uh, it's not just it's it's not just a, a sort of intellectual event that's happening when they're reading a book. They get drawn into a place, and we all do when we read good biography. We're drawn into a place. We start to uh, sympathize with the characters, or, or are repulsed by the character. Whatever you know, whatever the, the the traits of the character invite us to do, we do that because we're in the story. Um, mm -hmm. And so that, that can be important for a lot of reasons. Uh, I remember when I was working on my master's thesis on a theologian named William Hines, I'd been studying him. I'd contacted the family. I had pictures 
of Heinz and his family. I was deep into this story. And then somewhere in the story, I, I learned that this theologian's wife got, uh, she died by being burned up in a cooking fire. And when I learned that what, what otherwise might seem like just a little bit of information, um, it made me cry. You know, this was, this was not just, uh, uh, you know, someone who was distant from me. I'd gotten drawn into that story. Mm -hmm. And so it seemed very personal to me. And so I think that's one of the reasons why we should be reading and encouraging our children to read biography is that this is, this is the story of the church. Um, and we want our children to, to realize that they're part of that story. And so that they can, they can rejoice when the characters rejoice. They can weep when the characters weep. So, there, so it's a little bit, I think, like, um, uh, boy, I don't even know if people do this anymore. But when I was a kid, I used to flip through photo books that my parents had, you know, had brought together with pictures of my siblings and aunts and uncles and grandparents and great. And, and just flipping through that book made me realize I'm part of a story that's a lot bigger than me. And I think we need that especially in our day of individualism, where not only are uh, some churches tempted to sort of rewrite the Christian story for every new generation, sort of detaching that story from the past, but also where we tend to see ourselves as sort of the center of the universe, and we forget all who we're connected to. So I think first thing about Christian biography is just seeing the big picture of, you know, the fact that we're we're part of a, a stream that has been flowing before we stepped into it. And it came far upstream from where we find ourselves. So those kind of images. Um, and then I think too, that, you know, there's the more, maybe more concrete aspect of um, positive and negative example. Um, you know, we obviously like, there's, there's a lot more to Bible teaching than positive and negative example, but scripture doesn't shy away from that. Um, okay. Paul says in Philippians 3.17 that we should note those who walk like him as we have in them an example for us. And so, I mean, there's, there's all kinds of examples of, of godly living in the face of adversity that we find in, uh, in Christian biography. But of course, on the flip side, good, well-written Christian biography will focus on the negative traits of, you know, the heroes of the faith, people that we uh, that we identify with as being part of our family, but, you know, didn't always live the way that we ought to live. And so, you know, I think of, um, you think of like Stephen's sermon, for example, in Acts chapter seven, and it's basically a running commentary on how the leaders of Israel didn't learn from, you know, the bad examples of those who had come before them. And continue to per perpetrate the bad example, the, you know, ungodliness. So, so I think you know both the, the fact of learning from bad examples and good examples, um, but then also, uh, you know, it's Christian biography teaches us whether we're older or younger that we are receiving something that we're also going to be expected to guard and then pass on to those who come after us. So I think Christian biography is a little bit like listening to the elders of our tribe called the church, um, tell stories around a fire. You know, you, when, when you, when you listen to elders tell stories around a fire or, you know, in your living room or whatever, you, you realize that you're, you're, you're part of something bigger, you're, but you're part of something bigger. So it's not just the bigger thing. It's that you're part of it. And so I think Christian biography has that power, uh, in our, in our kids' lives too. So, um, yeah, I want to encourage, encourage uh, our young readers and, and parents of young readers to, to dip into Christian biography. When you enter into a biography, uh, you connect, I think, with, um, with that person and also what they wrote. So, for example, when I was getting my um, undergraduate degree, uh, I, I, I did a degree in apologetics, and I read a book by Cornelius Van Til. And it was very intense. It was my mm -hmm. first reading of Van Til. He, he can be very dense, and he's mm -hmm. obviously speaking in a context. Um, after I read that book of his, I went and got a biography of Van Til. And I just entered into that world, and it made me so much more appreciate, I That's guess, right. his writing, having entered into that context, th those debates, that world that he was um, li living in. And, uh, you know, I'm using my, uh, your um, books on the Heidelberg and the Canons of Dordan Belgic with my children. And as we finish the, 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 uh, the small biography on the, uh, the kind of the, the, the context and the background of the Heidelberg, 
we just wanted to get into the Heidelberg. Hmm. It just kind of yeah. wanted, you just kind of had that connection with right. the writing because you entered into that context and you saw the richness of it and you uh, saw the reasons for it and 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 uh, yeah got, got really excited about it. So you know, I love uh, Christian biography. Um, what um, what has made you, I guess, want to get into biography? I mean, the whole genre of biography, it's, it's something that you've uh, kind of been hovering around for some years. You mentioned even as you were a child, you know, just loving the story of even your, your own family, looking at albums and, and such. Is there anything else that really um, has given you an appreciation for the genre of biography? Yeah, well, I think part of it, part of the, one of the big parts of it, Brandon, is the ability of a biography to to help us understand the spirit of uh, the spirit of, of a particular age, but in a in a way that's interesting and particularized. And so, just take for example, uh, just finished reading uh, James Eglinton's uh, biography on Herman Bovink, and so it's a wonderfully told story of of one person primarily, a Dutch Reformed theologian from the 19th century. Um, but it also helps us to understand that difficult transition of moving uh, from, uh, you know, in, into a more self-conscious, uh, an age that was more self-consciously influenced by Enlightenment philosophy and, th and theology and how, th how that worked out in the life of one theologian and his immediate community. And so you could write a book on, you know, sort of philo philosophical book on that, on that m movement, that philosophical movement, but but focusing on a on a person is a, I think is able to accomplish the same thing, but in a way that's memorable, that's interesting, that's engaging, um, and that and that demonstrates how a, you know an actual person that's a, a little bit just like me navigated these hard challenges. So I think sort of the the way that biography sort of particularizes um, the spirit of an era, or you know I mentioned earlier writing the biography on a couple of biographies on Ulrich Zwingli, and. You, know, you can talk about, uh, you know, the, the, the broad context of Reformation theology, but I think in some ways to, it's best to complement that, that bigger picture with, with focusing on one character. You know, how does one character navigate the changes? And in Zwingli's ministry, for example, how he pushed back uh, against some of the, uh, what he perceived to be unbiblical changes that the Roman Catholic Church had, had developed over the years but then how his own students pushed back against him because he didn't go far enough, you know, in his reform, in their estimation. And so, so you can talk about uh, Roman Catholicism, Reformation theology, and, and, um, and the Anabaptist movement in sort of big picture, or you could focus in on a character and see how that works out in particular. And I think you're just going to be grabbed a lot more usually yeah, by, the, yeah. by the biographical approach. Yeah, for sure. So um, your second talk then at this conference is going to uh, be speaking about cultivating wisdom and virtue. Um, can, can you give us a kind of a sneak peek in that talk at all? Yeah. So what I want to focus on, Brandon, is the um, uh, what Mark Knoll, well, sort of by way of introduction, what Mark Knoll has, ended up, has identified as the scandal of the evangelical mind. He says that the scandal of the evangelical mind is that there is not much of an evangelical mind. In other words, that we have uh, really, no matter where we are, mainly um, in in sort of our place in in the church, we are heirs of a sort of either anti-intellectualism on the one hand, sort of just a you know perceiving Christianity to be purely a spiritual uh, endeavor, uh, or a pursuit of knowledge that doesn't accord with biblical wisdom. So we might be chasing after degrees and uh, a sort of educational route that we think is going to pay well, but not truly developing an evangelical, a biblical mind. And so um, just want to hold out the, the, first of all, the calling of Christians and particularly young people to prize wisdom, first of all, that wisdom is something that, you know, God Throughout the Word of God, wisdom is set before us as the chief virtue that actually opens up to us, you know, the, the ways to live out the rest of the virtues that God has called to us to live, but with greater understanding. Um, so we need to prize wisdom. We need to see that it's not uh, it's not acceptable to God to sort of put our minds to rest as we think we're following the Scriptures. We can't do that. 
But then more than that, not just prizing wisdom, not just seeing it as something uh, valuable, but actually to pursue wisdom. What does it look like to pursue wisdom? And I think sometimes we might imagine that um, we're sort of, you know, wisdom is implanted in us at conversion. And of course, there's a certain sense in which, you know, the Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So there's that, that ability to see the world rightly uh, when, we, when we come to Christ, when we're given the mind of Christ. But then what do we do with that mind? You know, how do we love God with our minds or have minds in love with God, as someone else has put it? So um, how do we pursue it? How do we, ch- how do we ch- chase after wisdom in the right way? I want to focus on that. Um, and one of the things that we have to learn to do, especially in this age of um, sort of information overload, is to prioritize what we take in, right? You, in other words, it's a little bit like a diet. There are all kinds of food options set before us, you know, in a restaurant or in a, in a grocery store. How do you prioritize what you should be eating? And so I want to th- take a look at, you know, way, places to spend more of our time in the pursuit of wisdom. So some real practical ways of saying yes to more of this and no to, to some of this other stuff. Um, and then we also, uh, following uh, some of the great stuff that Cal Newport has written lately, uh, want to also talk about how we how we protect our downtime. We can actually be, become wise by using uh, even our, our off moments wisely. And I think this kind of dovetails a little bit with what uh, the scripture calls meditation. You know, what do, what do we do when we when we technically have time to multitask or to, you know, to mindlessly flip through um, information that's being thrown at us, how do we sort of say no to that approach? And in our downtime, downtime, just learn to think, just learn to reflect on some of the experiences we've had recently or some of the things we've been reading. So I want to focus on meditation. Um, and then also just to recognize that um, with wisdom comes a responsibility that we have to practice what we know. In other words, wisdom is, a, is applied knowledge. And so uh, we want to encourage our young people that in the, uh, in the gaining of wisdom comes a responsibility, you know? So, um, you know, you talked about apologetics. It's possible to, as, as Lewis says in The Great Divorce, it's possible to be so intent mm-hmm. on defending the Bible or the faith that we actually um, are, are, are focused more on that than the Bible or on the faith, or right. it's possible as, you know, sort of from more of a missional angle to be, um, you know, so intent on spreading the Christian message that we forget about Christ. And so we have this responsibility to, uh, to love what we're learning, to put into practice. So, so I'm really excited about this, Brandon. I think that, um, you know, the church, the church is, des- is in desperate need of particularly young people who are mentally, intellectually equipped for the worldview battle that's raging around us. But tragically, too many of us are unprepared. I want my children, the next generation, to be better prepared for the worldview battle than I, than I am. And so I'm sure our parents want, the rest of the parents want that as well. So I think I'm, it's a great topic that you you focused on, and I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, and and um, one of the things I noticed, uh, you know, as you were talking about that, is you were you know speaking about um, putting on things, taking off things, you know, the the bad things, putting on the good, and so you you had a view there that's not purely intellectual, but something even more holistic that involves kind of head, heart, hands. It involves um, uh, not just doing something or, or, or defending or whatever, but, but loving a heart, uh, that, uh, loves Christ and hands that want to serve Christ. And so is, is that going to weigh in a, in a bit in your, in your topic at all about maybe a kind of head, heart and hands and how they're connected or, or the role of habit or anything like that? Yeah. I mean, habit's huge habit. I mean, what do we, uh, so we are, we, we develop pathways that we tend to keep walking in because they're familiar to us. So we want to develop good pathways. And, you know, so like downtime, for example, downtime is a huge uh, habit issue. Like we have habits of, you know, scrolling through our phones or, um, you know, turning on the TV and just seeing what's thrown at us. So so these are habits, you know, come home from work, you turn on the TV or whatever it is. And so ha- habits huge. Um, you know, Newport says at some place in uh, digital minimalism. You know, if 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 we took all the time that we use, um, sort of mindlessly, uh, social media or whatever it is, whatever it is, and just picked literally any hobby that we wanted to learn or or become 
competent in or some new discipline or some new uh, topic that we want to become more masters of. We could do it. We, the time is available to us. It's how do we make, what kind of choices do we make and how do we discipline ourselves with time? So I think that's a big part of it. And then just, yeah, going back to heart, um, you know, when Jesus says you shall love the Lord your God with your heart, mm-hmm. soul, mind, and strength, all of those come in together. And I think sometimes in, in the Christian church, we think about loving God as simply being a, you know, it's, it's connected with passion. You know, how do we, um, or, or our emotions or our feelings, or sometimes even our volition, if we talk about, you know, with our strength. But what does it mean to love God with our minds? How do we have minds are, that are captivated, you know, take every thought captive for Christ? Um, so, yeah, we, you know, this is all part of being more holistically Christian. It's, it's not to leave our minds aside when we're following after Jesus. I love what uh, the first chapter of Daniel says about Daniel and his friends, that they were like 10 times more, you know, mentally able to respond to the issues that the king were putting before them than his other helpers. And so that was one of the reasons why their testimony was meaningful to, uh, you know, to the king of, of, uh, of, of Babylon. And so um, we just, we want it, we want that kind of a pursuit where it's not just feelings, it's not just action oriented, mm-hmm. but it's, it's a thoughtful following after Christ. Yeah. Amen. So I am, I am really looking forward to, to those. Um, thanks for joining me on a Cincy Reformed podcast. Uh, we are a podcast of uh, Westside Reformed Church. You can visit us at um, cincyreformed.org or westsidereformed.org. And I will have uh, links in the show notes page to the upcoming conference if you're um, interested. But uh, thanks for joining in. Thank you.